Are you ready to get in the Word of God this morning? Are you ready to rekindle that fire in your heart this morning? Well, turn with me to Acts chapter 1. For those who are visiting, we are not what is called a Reformation movement. We're trying to reform Christianity like it's broken. But we are a restoration movement where we're trying to restore first century principles to our modern day age. And where is the blueprint for a church to follow is the book of Acts. For those who don't know about the book of Acts, it's written by Luke, who wrote also the book of Luke. And it is, the book of Acts is known as the Acts of the Apostles, but also is known as the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And we understand the Holy Spirit right here. And let's look at verse 1 real quick. It says, if you don't have a Bible this morning, please share with your neighbor. This is church, amen. All right, Acts 1 verse 1 says, In my former book, so he's talking about the book of Luke, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord... Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or days the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What a great start right here by Jesus. Jesus does got done being crucified, but our great Lord did not stay dead. He resurrected on the third day. And right here, he's in Jerusalem with his disciples. And I love it says that he gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He had many eyewitness testimonies to see that Jesus, in fact, resurrected from the dead. They saw the scars in his wrist and his ankles and even the pierce on his side. He gave many convincing proofs. But it says that when he resurrected, he didn't go straight to heaven. It says that he spent 40 days on earth convincing people he's alive, but talking about one incredible topic. What do you see him talking about? The very kingdom of God. So day one, you come to his his classroom. What does Jesus talk about? The kingdom of God. Day number two, the kingdom of God. Man, is he going to say anything else? The kingdom of God for 40 straight days. And I love, he he tells them to wait in Jerusalem until you get this incredible gift. And he goes on, he references John the Baptist. And we want to know what John the Baptist was for. He was a baptizer. He would baptize people in the Jordan. He says, I tell you the truth. You stay in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit is going to come on you and be filled with power. But the disciples are kind of dull still. They're like, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You understand Jesus' disciples, they're still a little religious. They're still following Judaism. They're used to a physical king. They're used to a physical castle on all these rules and regulations. And Jesus is like, you don't know. What are you talking about? I've been with you for three years, teaching you, correcting you, rebuking you, and training you in righteousness, and you still don't understand. But you will understand soon. But then he tells them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But then he promises this. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You're going to be my witness, not to just Jerusalem, not Judea, not just Samaria, but to the ends of of the earth that was God's incredible promise but that's God's ultimate vision it was the spirit's vision that the whole world 
would understand who God really is. That they'd understand the truth and come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved. But just like it says that the, the book of Acts is known as the Acts of the Apostles, but there's got to be something that's got to be guiding them, which was the Holy Spirit. A lot of people think when you get the Holy Spirit, it's about like you get like a, like a funny feeling or something like that. But really, it's a force. It's, a, it's forcing you not to live for yourself anymore. Yeah. Not to be comfortable, but to be radical and give your life up just like Jesus did. Because isn't that what a Christian is? A little Christ? Jesus forced himself to give himself to the people. And now he's telling the apostles, hey, you're going to get this power because you can't do it on your own strength. So I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit so you can be full of power to fulfill the Spirit's vision. Go to Acts chapter 2. Let's see him, this vision come true. When the Spirit comes on, the apostles right here is a powerful moment. In Acts 2 verse 1. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or languages as the Spirit enabled them. The vision continues. He tells them to stay in Jerusalem, and you have the apostles right here chilling, watching Netflix. I don't know what they're doing. Maybe singing some hymns, right, because Jesus left them. He went to heaven. They actually physically saw him go to heaven, and now they're hanging out in a room. They're praying, and all of a sudden, the room starts shaking, and then balls of tongues of fire lands on their head. Would you say that's a powerful moment? So did Jesus' words come true right here? Absolutely. And what does God allow them to start doing? Preaching in different languages. Because you continue reading chapter 2, what city are they in? Jerusalem. Who's here? All nations. So if somebody from a different nation comes here and I can't speak their language, we're in trouble. During this time, during this time they didn't have the Bible, actually. The Bible is still actually being written. So God actually put his spirit on the apostles that preached the very first gospel sermon. Isn't that incredible? And I love about this because this is the most powerful moment on the planet. That God puts his spirit on his people to guide the people and bring in. But you know what's even more powerful? Let me tell you what's more powerful. Drop down to verse 38. So Peter is in the middle, he stands up and he starts preaching the first gospel sermon, telling the people who Jesus was. He's from God, died on the cross for our sins, and rose on the third day. But he didn't stop there, though. Right here in Acts 2, verse 36, it says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Isn't that what Zeno shared this morning when he actually studied the Bible and he learned about the cross? Wasn't his heart cut? And he just like wanted to get radical and live his life for God. But how do we do that? Well, what does Peter say right after that in verse 38? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, he pleaded with them, he's begging them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Talk about an incredible church service right here. This is the first church service here in Jerusalem. And it's an amazing lesson, but Peter, how's he closing up strong? He calls the people to actually do something. See, if I don't call you to do something, then I didn't preach the word correctly, amen? And what does Peter call them to do? 
He says, because you killed Jesus, because we all have sin and fall short of the glory of God, and sin is what killed Jesus, we're all murders this morning. Yeah. And for those who study the Bible, we understand that. And then what does Peter command them to do right after they learn about their sin killing Jesus? He tells them to repent. Well, what does repent mean? It doesn't mean asking for forgiveness. That makes no sense in this context, context right here. Repent means to turn a 180. Meaning if you're, you're living in drunkenness, you get away from that. You don't even like look at alcohol anymore. Yeah. That's repentance. But he didn't say repent and just believe. Just repent and believe the message. He says repent and get baptized yeah. in the name of Jesus Christ. And it's awesome because we're going to have Donna and Renee get baptized in the name of Jesus today. <laughs> but the incredible moment that we see right here, though, is when individuals say, Jesus, Lord, and they get baptized, what are they receiving, though? It says they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is the most powerful moment in the Bible, that God in heaven decided to trust us with the most sacred thing is himself. He gives us his Holy Spirit. Well, Why? to force us to fulfill the Spirit's vision. That he could send us and scatter us all around the world and preach his word. Didn't it say that in Romans 10, how beautiful are the feet that bring good news? But if you're not getting forced by the Spirit, you're not going to go to the ends of the earth. Right here, God is looking down and you see the first church service. Like, this is my dream team. They're going to conquer the world in my name. They're going to finish this task. Of we're in the, right, we're in the ways. The title lesson for you this morning is the Spirit's vision. The Spirit's vision. See, the moment they got baptized, they received the Holy Spirit. And I love how, you know, Peter, he's like kind of, he's still having to talk them into doing this. Because why? The group Jews and Judaism, they're following the law of Moses. They're like, okay, I just got to do this. I got to worship the Sabbath. I got to offer all these sacrifices for my sins. But no, no, no. Jesus is the sacrificial lamb now. All you got to do is put your faith in him, repent and get baptized, and carry out his ministry. Very simple. That's very challenging. Because not everybody's going to accept this message. Well, who accepted the message? He said about 3,000. If you actually study this out, there's, there, commentators believe there's about 100,000 people here in Jerusalem for Pentecost. And if you don't know what Pentecost is, it's to celebrate what they had a tradition called Passover. Because if you're an Israelite, God save the Israelites by sending a destroying angel to kill the firstborns in the days of Moses. And what they did, they had a, a cup of lamb and put the blood on the doorframe and the angel would pass over it. And in 50 days of that, you would celebrate Pentecost and you'd, you'd give back to God your harvest. And right here, what, what happened 50 days prior to this? Jesus died on the cross. He was our sacrificial lamb. And we can learn how to get the blood of Christ so we get our sins forgiven and get his Holy Spirit to complete the Spirit's vision. So what that entails is if we're going to completely evangelize the world, it's not going to be on our own strength, amen? amen. It's not going to be on our own intellect, our own how smart we are. No, it's all about the Holy Spirit moving through you. Turn me to Galatians chapter 5. In Galatians chapter 5, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit this morning. Because I, I believe many people don't really understand the Holy Spirit. Like, you know, they think it's like a feeling or whatnot. But I tell you this morning, it is a force. It's to force you out of yourself. Because we don't have the Holy Spirit, then we're going to be full of ourselves. Amen? We don't want that. We don't want that. In Galatians 5, let's look what Paul says to the church here in Galatia. I believe he gives the church incredible instructions. Let's see what it says in verse 16. Right. It says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. It says they are in conflict with each other, so that... You are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Man, I love the Bible. The Bible is very practical. It says that there's two enemies going, there's, like, there's, there's a war going on in every single one of us if you have the Holy Spirit. You got your flesh and you got your spirit. 
and they do not like each other. The flesh wants to do its own thing, and the spirit wants to do it. The spirit wants to evangelize the world. The flesh wants to evangelize their own life. And they're at they're odds at each other. But I love it says, Paul says, you gotta be, you gotta walk with the spirit. And it says in verse 18, it says, but if you are led by the spirit, you catch that? If you're led by the spirit. What does that imply? It is a decision, it is a choice to actually decide to live by the Spirit of God. Daily decisions. Well, well, what does it look like for an individual that does not live by the Spirit? Well, it says it right after that, verse 19. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, church, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Eight years ago, I learned about this list, and it changed my life. Because Paul is telling the Christians right here in Galatia, says, if you live like this, you're not going to heaven. I don't care what church you go to. I don't care what label you slap yourself with. I don't care if your dad's a pastor. This is the truth right here. You cannot live by someone else's faith. You have to have your own personal faith. The Bible says you got to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. This scripture causes you to be fearful and trembling. Amen. So if you're not living by the spirit, if you're not in step with the spirit, then this is what your life should look like. And for time's sake, we're not going to break down these sins because, you know, I think you guys, are, you see it right there. Yeah. Study out on your own time. But I want to focus on the Holy Spirit this morning. Come on. Come on. Well, how do you know if you're with the Holy Spirit? Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. What are we looking for this morning? Every single person is looking for love. But who's going to give it? Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such thing, there's no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. So we understand, what does it really mean to live for the Spirit? It gives us all the clues. These are the traits that should be displayed in your life. Are you loving? Are you joyful? Wow. Or are you just like that, you know, like Eeyore all the time? My life's just horrible all the time. You know, no one cares about me. No one loves me. I'm still single. Oh. Are you peaceful this morning? Maybe I did just disturb your peace. Forbearance, are you forgiving? Are you hold grudges? Are you slow to forgive your brother or sister when they sin against you? It says gentleness. My brothers, are you being gentle to your roommates? My sisters, are you being gentle in how you speak to one another? And then it says self-control. Hopefully we're not in debt this morning, overspending on your Starbucks every single morning. Well, well, why? Why do we do that? It says, well, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So our great passion and desires should no longer to choose sin, but to choose him. But then it goes on and says, since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. This is a challenging passage because it says you got to be in step with the spirit. So what does that imply? You can actually be out of step with the Holy Spirit. You might not even know that you live for God anymore because you, you totally did not walk with God like you should. You have a little bit of sin, a little bit of the fruit. A little bit of sin, a little bit of the fruit. No, 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 no. That's called hypocrisy. That is the problem with the world. There's a church on every block that tell you what you want to hear. Now you come to church and still sin. It's okay. Just keep putting the money in the control plate. But that's not what my Bible reads right here. You have to be in step with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. It says, not, let us not become conceited. Yeah. We live in a world where, man, we just want a selfie every five minutes. Oh, no. oh. Look at me. 
And they do it so they can get all those likes on Facebook and Instagram. So they can become famous and become their own guys so people bow down to them. We can't be that. Or provoking. You know what provoking means? Is you're, you're, not so, you're not grateful for your own life, so you want to try to bring, down, bring people down with you. So you're trying to get other people to sin. But then it says, and envying each other. You desire what other people have. And when Matthew proposed to Vivian, it was amazing, wasn't it? But hopefully there was no envy in your heart saying, I wish that was me. What is it going to be me? You don't, you don't go up and give your brother a hug and say, bro, great job. Great for perseverance. But then you're like, man, that should have been me. If it was you, God would make that clear to you. We got to be grateful just for the life that God gave you. I think Zeno did an incredible job on how to look at your life and have a faithful mentality. Say, you know what? God didn't give me a great life for my own reason. He's like, no, I want to give you a broken life so I can be the one to fix you. And then people can see the glory in your life. But what I'm learning when I was writing this lesson was, again, I want to talk about the Holy Spirit. Because I believe when we're full of the Holy Spirit, we can accomplish the Spirit's vision. Are you with me? So I got three points for you this morning. And how can we be full of the Holy Spirit? Because I believe that's how God designed it. Is we got to continue to replenish ourselves. Just like cars, right? How many times do we have to stop and get gas? At least once a week, right? Or if you're traveling from Austin, you probably already got to fill up, amen? But if you don't fill yourself with the Holy Spirit on a daily basis, and you try to put water and sugar in your gas tank of a car, you're going to destroy that car. We got to make sure we don't put water and and sugar in our own tank spiritually, amen? Because God God designs and he wants us to depend on him. All right, so my point number one is, let's go to Acts chapter 4. Three ways on how you can be full of the Holy Spirit. Because I've heard this being saying, like, man, I don't feel close to God. I feel like I'm, like, I'm not close to him. He's not hearing my prayers. I'm not really emotionally connecting with God. Well, I'm going to help you connect with God this morning. It's a decision you got to make. There's no matter how many motivational speaking words I send to you, you got to make decisions and choose God yourself. Point number one, you got to have earth-shaking prayers. Earth shaking prayers. Well, let's look at Acts 4 and let's drop down to verse 23. So, to this point, you know, that the church started in Acts 2, that about 3,000 people, like I added. Um, well, how are they doing lately? Well, let's pick it up in verse 1, actually. It says, The priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. I know the great church here in Houston hopes to get to 5,000 men one day, amen? But how are we going to do that? It's by being full of the Holy Spirit. Well, drop down to verse 23. So we understand Peter and John, they're having a great day sharing their faith. And they welcome persecution to the point where they got thrown in jail. They're having a nice little day right there. I could tell that they're probably in jail singing songs to God because what else are they going to do in there? And they finally let them go. Well, look, this is what it says in verse 23. It says, on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up, and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against their holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. 
They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider the threats. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where their meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. How's your prayer time this morning? My Bible tells me that the disciples got together after receiving opposition. Learning that the world is plotting against, they already did against Jesus, but now they're going after Jesus' servants, the disciples. And they're plotting on how to kill them. And how when they heard the news, like, man, that's, not, that's some troubling news right there. What did they decide to do? They decided, like, you know, I'm, I'm done. I want to be a Christian. I'm just going to go back and live a comfortable life. No. They got determined, and they started praying out loud to God. And they said, Sovereign Lord. That's how they introduced God. Well, what does sovereign mean? It means God allows things to happen or makes things happen. I love it says, it says sovereign, but then it says Lord. Well, what does Lord really mean? It means master. He's the one that's controlling your life. So we feel controlled this morning. Hopefully it's by Jesus, not your sin. Yay. They had a deep conviction of who Jesus was. And I love how they, they, remind, they remind God like he needs reminders. He says, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Yeah, I know. That was a long time ago. I'm glad you you're reminded me of that. Because sometimes I guess God needs reminders. I don't know. Remember Noah? He did the same thing. Like, well, God, like, you're going to kill everybody? No, 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 no. I'll spare you and your family. But, but, but all these people, I'm going to have a new covenant with you. But then it goes on, and they start praying deeper. And they says, God, consider their threats. You understand this morning, if you're a sold-out disciple, you are a threat to Satan and his empire. You are a threat and what do you think Satan's going to try to do? He's going to come at you with everything that he has. Our battle is not against flesh and blood this morning. It's because of the dominion of darkness and Satan himself. It says, consider the threats and enable us to speak the word of God boldly. But I love when it says, after they prayed, the place where their meeting was shaken. They shake the nations. It says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So how do you get full of the Holy Spirit? You better pray like you believe it. That you believe the Holy Spirit actually lives in you. Because if you don't actually believe the Holy Spirit's really in you, you're not going to pray like it. These people believe it so much that they were begging God to move, and they saw the earth shake. Well, how, what kind of prayer should we be praying? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 5. Let's look at a little bit of Jesus' prayer life, and let's compare it to ourselves. In Hebrews 5, let's look at verse 7. I believe this is how we're going to cure the world. It's having earth-shaking prayers. In Hebrews 5, verse 7, I'll wait till you guys get there. He goes, I hear you all flipping, you know. All right, cool. Hebrews 5, verse 7. It says, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who can save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. So what kind of prayer life did Jesus have? Well, it says that he, had, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears. So what does that imply? Jesus was crying out because this life was so hard. And he says, I can't do anything on my own strength. He leaves an example to follow. Say, hey, when life gets hard, when your circumstances aren't what you want, you got to pray harder. you got to pray harder than your hardship. And I love, again, Zeno painted a great picture. When you face hardship, you got to turn to God. He's the only one that can help you overcome. But again, prayer is not like, you know, going to God and ask me, give me, give me, give me, give me. He's not a genie. He's not going to give you what you wish for. He'll give you what you need. What is prayer ultimately all about? It's all about reverent submission. I think sometimes we can go into prayer and forget who we're praying to. 
We can have what's called a psychotherapy session with God. Like, God, why is my life so hard? Man, why do I have to live paycheck after paycheck after paycheck? Why am I still single, God? Do you even care about me? And this could be our prayer with God. And God's like, hmm. did you forget all my promises in the Bible? That my plans are not to harm you, but give you hope in a future? That if you actually love me, I'll take care of you? Did you forget all that? Because sometimes we can let our circumstances dictate God's promises. We can throw out the promises of God because our circumstances are so hard. But God wants to see what's in your heart. The reason why I didn't give you that high-paying job, because you would have you idolized it. You would have made money your God. So again, you have to persevere this 9-to-5 job that you don't like until you actually have the character enough and the heart to actually do it the right way. Amen. And the reason why you're still single this morning, because if I gave you a girlfriend or a boyfriend, you just idolize him. Whoa. You care more about what he thinks of you or she thinks of you rather than God himself. Or maybe you're a campus student, maybe you idolize your parents and you care more what they think of you than what God thinks of you. We gotta love our parents, but at the end of the day, God's word is right here. Do you have your parents' words on your heart or God's word on your heart? And I love like when you go into prayer, usually what you pray for kind of dictates what kind of heart you have. If you're only going to prayer to ask God for things, you're not in the right spot. Jesus is trying to figure out, how do I submit to you? That's what prayer is for. Isn't that what he did in the Garden of Gethsemane when he got, before he got arrested? Right. Yeah. He's, with, he's feeling overwhelmed to the point of sorrow. He's with his close friends. Like, all right, guys, you guys can't do anything for me. Let's go over there. I'm going to go pray. He's like, God, may that you take this cup. I don't want to do it. Are you even listening to me? All right, I'm going to come back. And what are the disciples doing? They're sleeping. It's like, all right, definitely can't count on people. He goes back and he prays the same thing. He's like, God, if, all right, if you can't take this cup, this wrath that you're pouring on myself, please grant me success to be able to do it. Amen. Give me the strength to finish the greatest vision of dying for humanity. Yeah. The Bible says that he prayed for three hours. How long have we been praying for? He was the son of God. Every time I study the prayer life of Jesus, I get flat out convicted. But think about it. Jesus was praying for submission, to do God's will, to fulfill the, Lord, the Spirit's vision. Well, what are we praying like? I think one thing that can help us as human beings is to look at the news, to see what's going on, not just in the world, but look what's going on in our very own state of Texas. Rob Elementary School. We all understand the news. 19 children fourth graders were killed. Two teachers had the guts to stand up and protect the little ones and they lost their lives. That's what's going on in the world. Does that even move your heart to want to go pray for them? We got to pray for the families. That's the darkness that's going on in the world. If we're not praying, darkness will reign. Are you with me? We can't be a people that only go to God and ask for things. We're going to pray for God's spirit to move. That we can fulfill the greatest vision of world evangelism. Come on, bro. That a guy, a young man had, like, he is so broken up here from being bullied. He had the, he thought the only purpose I had is go to an elementary school and kill people. Right. Can you imagine if this guy would have got a reached out by a sold out disciple yeah. and actually had a chance to say the Bible would get his mind right? Yeah. Satan is taking people's thoughts captive. We're supposed to take our thoughts captive, but Satan's trying to take everyone's thoughts captive and use them for his glory, which is destruction. But I believe if we're a people that have earth-shaking prayers, we will shake not only Texas, but the world. But we got to get more impacted. We got to allow the world to impact our hearts. And we got to start praying more. Don't focus on praying to change your life, but to change the world. You know, Jesus says that he offered loud cries. Let me ask you this morning. When was the last time you cried in prayer? Or has your heart gotten too hard? See, when, you're, when your heart is hard, you will not see tears flow. See, as you get older, the heart is so hard to, to keep soft. 
And I remember talking to my, uh, my dad last week, and he you know, broke the news to me that my stepmom had breast cancer. And I was so, like, it was troubling news. And my dad, his heart is so soft because he's gone through so much tragedy lately. He lost his brother-in-law, and a few years back, he lost my grandpa. And my, my dad, growing up, you know, I saw this, like, this unmovable rock. This guy, I'd never see cry. But these last couple of years, as he's gotten older, his heart's gotten so soft. He's, he's cried so much in my life. I'm like, what the heck? What was, how do you get your heart so soft? I'm like, Dad, well, what happened when you were in your 20s and your 30s? Why, 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 why didn't you have this emotion? He's like, well, son, I lost my, my gratitude for things. See, when you get older, you get more grateful for things. Either we learn that lesson now or you're going to have to really learn it later in your life. Can you imagine if the younger group learned how to have a heart that's soft, that learns how to keep their gratitude? That's the kind of prayer God is looking for. That we would not focus on ourselves, but we focus on all that's going on in the world. But it takes having earth-shaking prayers. I want to challenge us this morning. Shake up your prayer life by praying in new spots. Find new spots to spend time with God. But then, sometimes when you go into prayer, you ask for something too. Because God does care what you, what you want. You can forget what you pray for. What I want you to do after you pray... Write down your prayer requests. So when God actually delivers in your life, you can go back to that journal. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Write the date and write what prayer he answered. And then you give God glory for his faithfulness because he's always faithful. Amen? Amen. That leads me to my second point. Let's go to Luke chapter 24. And Luke chapter 24, we have to have earth-shaking prayers. But point number two is we have to have a, a burning heart. A burning heart. Because you want to be full of the Holy Spirit, you must be praying, but you must have a burning heart. Right. And Luke 24 and verse 30. Let's go, bro. Come on, Tyler. Right here, Jesus, again, he just got crucified. And now he's appearing to the disciples. But sadly, the disciples lost touch of who Jesus was. They didn't recognize Jesus right here. And look what happens in verse 30. It says, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. I love how Jesus just died for them, and then he's still serving them. It says, then their eyes were open, and then they recognized him. And then he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Okay, well, how do we have a burning heart? It's through the scriptures. So when Jesus resurrected, they didn't even recognize him. Not until he broke bread and started sharing the scriptures. It says, our hearts were burning because of the word of God. And I love and I think about this because raise your hand if you've ever been burned by something before. See how we remember that? <laughs> I remember putting my hand on the stove and it was the worst decision of my life. But... Now remember when you first did your first Bible study. Remember when your heart got on fire for God's word? You're like, man, this is awesome. And you're like, oh, you're on this high. You had this great fire in your heart. But then what can happen when you have a blazing fire? You can start to lose it. You can start losing the love for God's word. Because what happens is you can study so much. You have a lot of knowledge and theology and ideology in your head. But you really stopped applying it. It's kind of like a fire. How do you keep a fire going? Get one more log, one more log. <laughs> you have to watch it, put more log on. If you find your fire going out for God's word, it's because you're not putting every effort. Do you see to it that the fire is going in your heart? Yeah. It's not going to be easy to keep the fire going. It takes a lot of work. Yeah. Just like when you get passionate for something. I know a lot of us love playing sports. and uh, My favorite sport is basketball. And you know, Jerry just wanted to tell me, or to let me tell you guys, he beat me one-on-one. But the thing is, when I grew up playing sports, I had a passion, though. Like, I would literally watch basketball games after basketball game after basketball game. I would play from sunup to sundown. I had all the jerseys. I had the Michael Jordan jersey, the Kobe Bryant jersey. I had all the Jordan shoes. I wanted to be like Mike. I had a passion for sports. And we all can find something that we're very passionate about. We, we spend our time. We spend our money. We're committed. We have the desire in our hearts. But then something happens where you start to lose it. 
It starts not to become fun anymore. It starts to become like a job. That could be your Christianity. That God might just be like your boss now. You're just like, oh, I just coming to serve in. Oh, I got to sing again. And you're just like, you just go through the motions. You lose your heart for God's word. You stop putting more scriptures into your heart, but you're just putting it into your head. Some people are like, we stop worshiping God, but we start worshiping what he said. I have all these scriptures in my head, in my heart, but I'm not loving like Jesus anymore. I'm totally isolated from God. That's the biggest scare for me is just to get religious. The world's not going to be saved by just religious people. It's for people that actually live like Jesus, that preach his same message and live the way he lived. But how we do that is continuously putting the scriptures in your heart, even when you don't feel like it. And you have questions, you feel concerned, you feel doubt coming. Well, get with your brother and sister and ask those questions. Seek the truth. For me, what made me say the Bible was, I was a truth seeker. I always, I always believed in God, but I had no idea what the Bible actually said. I had no idea how to train my life by this. And I had an incredible conversation with David during the fellowship break because that, that's such a temptation for everybody. It's like, you know what? Man, I just like, it's, it's called perseverance. And it takes a lot of work because why? Satan's going to throw so much stuff at you to get you distracted. But when did Jesus spend time with God? Early in the morning. <laughs> it says he got up, left the house, went to a solitary place, and he prayed and he spent time with God. Because why? Everybody was looking for him. See, when you're walking in step with the Spirit, everybody wants something from you. Amen. That's true. Like when you're doing great spiritually, that's when a lot of responsibility starts coming in your life. And, but if you don't keep putting more scriptures in your heart, the Bible says you got to meditate on day and night. If you live in during this time period, the Jewish people are the most religious people on the planet. Get this. In order to be like a rabbi or like a Pharisee, you had to memorize the first five books of the Bible. Word for word. I'm so glad that I don't got to do that, but we should do that, though. We should know God's word so you know how to live always. But I believe what's going to help us continue to put the fire in our hearts. Please turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. In 2 Peter chapter 1, this is a scripture I was read when I was just a couple weeks old spiritually. And it still sticks to me to this day. In 2 Peter chapter 1, let's look at verse 3. You've got to understand, knowledge is what empowers us to live for God. It's what keeps our heart burning. And in verse 3... It says, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. All right, this is awesome to know. God has called us to escape this corrupt generation and the evil desires. So what do we got to do? Verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. Man, that sounds like a lot of work, huh? It says, for if, catch that word, if, you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Come on, bro. See, when your heart is on fire for God's word, you should see yourself getting stronger, not weaker. You should see yourself increasing in these qualities. You should see yourself being productive, producing crops for the Lord. Like it says to the parable of the sower, those who have their, their soil on the good seed, it says they produce a crop, making disciples. But you're never going to be able to make a disciple if you don't allow the, the word of God to be your everything. Yeah. Yeah. It says you've got to make every effort. 
See, I want to talk to the young Christians who just got baptized. See, you had faith, and you're like, man, I got baptized, now I'm good. I'm good to go. But what does it say now? It says, add to your goodness knowledge. Right now, your mind is like a sponge. You're like absorbing everything. You've got to continuously reading more and more books. I love how we're being a part of a kingdom where we have many people rising up to write books. Now, we have a lot of spiritual books out there that I encourage you to buy. But it says you cannot just stop at knowledge, but then you learn how to have self-control. That you're not like an animal and you're just going to sin every time. You don't know how to control yourself. You actually can be controlled by the Spirit of God if you allow it. But I love that it says if you possess these qualities, though, in increasing measure, they'll keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. See, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be someone that's known for being unproductive. Have you ever worked at those jobs where you're doing all the work and you look over and you see your coworker just like, just chilling? Maybe you're on their phone texting, you're like, you better help me with this work. We're getting paid the same. Or being ineffective. Like, I don't know about you, but I don't like being ineffective at something. I want to be effective and I want to be producing something. And I believe God has called us to do an incredible task of evangelizing our great city of Houston. And today, we're going to see two more get baptized. We're going to be 80 in the church. And just to remind you, just, just 10 months ago, my wife and I came here, this was 56. And now we're having 80 in the church, 80 strong. And we're about to send 11 awesome leaders out to OKC, LA, Kentucky. So what's that call for everybody else? To rise on up. Take on more responsibility. And it was awesome on Saturday. We had what is called our leaders in training meeting. And I had the privilege to really announce that three people are graduating from the lit program. You know, the first one, the, the couple I wanted to really just lift up this morning is Jarius and Zajay Moore back there. And they also have three little ones. They've done an incredible job raising on up. They've taken on much responsibility. And after the Castillo Juniors go to L.A., my wife and I will be discipling them and raising them on up. Because why? The word of God is like a fire in their heart. God is looking to see who has the fire in their heart. Because those who have the fire in their heart, God's going to raise on up. And another incredible woman of God. Strong character. I tell you, she's so disciplined. Trustworthy. Single. And that's our dear sister Shauna right here. She's always one step ahead of us. Like she's always putting stuff together. She just ordered our what's called our mercy t-shirts. She just gets things done, and now she's going to be placing Cassandra as one of our assistants in administration. Well, how do we get here? It's because they allow the Bible, the Word of God, produce a fire in their heart, and they fan it into flames. I want to challenge you guys. Study out a book or a character in the Bible you've never studied before. Because usually, like, find out, okay, what is your character weakness? And find something in the Bible that has that same character weakness. Because the Bible is full of broken people. I've done a lot of sin. If God can use them, God can use you. But it's all about making decisions. Like, am I going to choose the word of God this morning and the next morning and the next morning? Am I going to keep the fire going? Because you got to understand, we got to keep the fire going. Because that leads me to my final point. Let's close out here in Acts chapter 13. Point number three is, we got to be the light for all nations. Here in Acts 13, let's, let's pick it up in, the, in verse 47. we got to be the light for all nations. I can't wait to see these baptisms in a minute. In verse 47, give me a memory there. We'll close out here. It says, For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region. Can you imagine all the whole city of Houston heard the message of God? 
But the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the region. What a great day. So they shook the dust off their feet as a warning to them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So what's the first way before the Holy Spirit? By praying. What's the second way? Having God's word in your heart. Every time you have a quiet time, you can fool the Holy Spirit. But what's the third thing is? Is when you share your faith. Because now you have the fire in your heart, and hopefully people see it shining through you. Because right here, what do we see? Paul and Barnabas were radical when it came to sharing their faith. So they got filled with the Holy Spirit once they shared. And then it says they also were joyful. We got to be a people that when they look at us, like, wow, I can see the light of God in you. Man, I want to say the Bible with you. You know something I don't know. These guys convinced people to, to study the Bible. And I believe that's us this morning. Seeing us grow weekly, we're having over weekly additions in church. So what does that tell me? This church is full of the Holy Spirit. And what I love about today's service is we are celebrating our special missions. And I'm glad and proud to tell you guys, we have blew it on out. Amen. And I'll announce the total later on. But what we learn is what is special missions all about? We are, we are planting 24 churches. That ain't easy, guys. You got to be willing to say, you know what? I want to go. Because when you go, you can grow. Jay Sean, you got to stay. Because, you know, when you stay, you got to pay. You got to pay for your brothers and sisters to go all around the world to evangelize. 24 churches, 14 internationally. Think about that. We're not just trying to evangelize the United States, but we're getting everywhere. And we're planting 10 U.S. churches. Because why? we got to get to Austin. There's a lot of people I know in Austin that want to hear the word of God more. And be part of what we're doing here in Houston. Because why? We are truly being the light of the world. We are, we are literally changing one soul at a time. One city at a time. One state. Country. The world. That's who we are. We're doing this until what? The Spirit's vision is completed. We can be the generation to fulfill it. The world's only been evangelized one time. We can do it again. And Jesus gives us a little hint. says, once everyone has heard the message of the gospel, then he's coming back. We don't know who the last person's going to be. Remember, you're walking down to the Starbucks, and you're, you're having a quiet time, and you, see, you share it with the cashier. Boom, Jesus comes back. Wow. I'll inspire us, guys. Every time you share your faith, every time you're in a Bible study, you get filled with the Holy Spirit. I challenge you to get a Bible study this week. Get somebody out this Wednesday, this Friday, this Sunday. Continue to use the Holy Spirit through you because it is a force. And if we're a people that continue to live by the principles of the Bible, that we pray until we're full of the Holy Spirit, that we read until we're full of the Holy Spirit, and we share until we're filled with the Holy Spirit. We will see the Spirit's vision completed in our day. And I love you guys very much.